Good morning, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. God has been blessing us in a wonderful way, and it is a great privilege to worship together here in San Antonio on this last Sabbath morning of the 60th General Conference session. Let me just say something about San Antonio. This city has been so hospitable to Seventh-day Adventists. We want to thank the city and all of those who have made our stay so enjoyable. And I learned last night, I think it was, that they are remarking that this group of people have come to town, one of the largest groups that have ever been in San Antonio, and they don't seem to have any problems. Praise God for your testimony and your Christian witness. You know, we come from all parts of the globe, people filled with the Holy Spirit and ready to proclaim the three angels' messages with greater power as we learn from Jesus every day what it means to be his followers, united in this wonderful and tremendous movement, God's Advent movement and spiritual family. We thank the Lord for the ways that he has led this general conference session during the last 10 days. And we give him all the glory for the unity and singleness of purpose in accomplishing his mission for this dying earth. As I stated five years ago, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is God's remnant movement made up of those who, according to Revelation 12:17, keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And we are on a heaven-directed journey. We must go forward, not backward, because we are almost whole. I'm more convinced than ever before that Jesus' return is near, even at the door. Our session theme song that has served us so well for so many years, We Have This Hope, proclaims the great expectation of Seventh-day Adventists all around this globe. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus viene pronto. Jesus revient bientôt. Brevi, Jesus voltera. Jesus anacuja caribuni sana. Jesus prediot scora. Jesus nimi cold o chimnida. Ha ana ati serian. Yesu Jailai Yesu Jeldi Aiga Si Jesus Ai Malapit Nang Dumiting And in so many other languages of the world we share these words of encouragement and of hope. It's the great theme of this 2015 General Conference session. Arise shine. Jesus is coming. We long for Jesus' return. But why are we still here? For some time, Jesus has longed to come back. We have no more time prophecies. Those ended in 1844 with the beginning of the investigative judgment. At this very moment, Christ is ministering for us in the most holy place of a real sanctuary in heaven. He wants to pour out the latter rain of the Holy Spirit upon his people to finish his work on this earth. He longs for us to humble ourselves before him and to lean completely upon his everlasting arms. 
He wants us to share his good news of salvation, that we're saved by grace, and that not of ourselves, lest we should boast, but it is a gift of God, as we read in Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 9. As we share his righteousness, justification, and sanctification that works in us, both to will and to do for his good pleasure, as Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 tells us. As we share the work that he has begun, he will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, as Philippians 1, 6 states. But we are Laodiceans and need to humble ourselves before the Lord and buy of him as instructed in Revelation 3.18, gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. Yes, Lord, take us mold us, make us, and fill us, revive and reform us through your daily sanctifying power as we read your holy word, your spirit of prophecy, and earnestly pray for the Holy Spirit in our lives. Yes, brothers and sisters, revival and reformation for this new quinquennium and until the end of probation, revival and reformation, you, your family, your church, your community. We want this experience through the blood and the grace of Jesus Christ and a daily walk with him. We want to go home. We know the signs of Matthew 24 and realize political challenges are now beyond the control of most governments today. Economic conditions are fragile and untrustworthy. Natural disasters are increasing in intensity and destruction. Social changes are challenging the very word of God. Ecumenism is rapidly growing in its false, non-biblical, and neutralizing influence on society. And yes, yet we are still here. But God says, arise, shine. He's telling us to be powerful testimonies of Christ's marvelous message to this chaotic world, indicating that the great controversy is about to close and Jesus will return for his people three times in the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, verses 7, 12, and 20. Jesus himself says, I am coming quickly. Lord, we want to go home. We want to cross over the Jordan River to the promised land. Open the way before us. Take us through the water, Lord. We place our trust completely in you and you alone. Lead us through the raging Jordan to our everlasting home. And don't let us retreat. Help us to fully depend on you for every need in spite of the temptation to retreat. You are our rock and our salvation. Help us to cross the Jordan and not to retreat. I don't know how many thousands there are here, but every one of you, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 1 through 5. And as we look at that beautiful section of God's Word, we read, Then Moses went up 
from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. Moses was so close and yet so far. The Bible indicates that when Moses died, God himself buried Moses. We know that God raised Moses back to life and took him to heaven as an example of those who will die in Christ and be raised through his reviving power at the second coming when that trumpet will sound. About a year ago, it was a privilege to stand on Mount Nebo and look out at the vast plains below north toward the Sea of Galilee, across the Jordan River to Jericho, southward to the Dead Sea. It was a thrilling experience to realize that God spoke to Moses there and let him see the future history of Israel's ups and downs, their revived commitment to God and their falling away back into self-centered and idolatrous practices. He saw their subjection to foreign powers. He saw Jesus coming as a baby and his wonderful, perfect life and ministry. He saw the agony in Gethsemane, the betrayal, the beatings, and the crucifixion. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 475 to 476, tell us his heart was wrung with anguish and bitter tears fell from his eyes in sympathy with the sorrow of the Son of God. Grief, indignation, and horror filled the heart of Moses as he viewed the hypocrisy and satanic hatred manifested by the Jewish nation against their Redeemer. He heard Christ's agonizing cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But he looked again and beheld him coming forth a conqueror and ascending to heaven, escorted by adoring angels and leading a multitude of captives. He saw the shining gates open to receive him and the host of heaven with songs of triumph welcoming their commander. And it was there revealed to him that he himself, Moses, would be one who should attend the Savior and open to him the everlasting gates. You see, God revealed to Moses the history of the Christian church as the disciples preached the gospel, how all those who accepted Christ's method or Christ's message would become by faith part of Abraham's seed, making to the world the law of God and the gospel of his son. He saw the Christian world profess to accept Christ but deny God's law. He saw the seventh day ignored and rejected by the majority, but few, but respected by a faithful few. You see, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 477 says, he saw the last great struggle of earthly powers to destroy those who keep God's law. He heard God's covenant of peace with those who have kept his law. He saw the second coming of Christ in glory. Then he saw the new earth, the promised land, more beautiful than anything that was spread out before him. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 477, describes it in this way, with joy unutterable. Moses looks upon the scene, the fulfillment of a more glorious deliverance than his brightest hopes have ever pictured. Their earthly wanderings forever past, the Israel of God have at last entered the goodly land. Let's go to Mount Nebo for a few moments, where Moses viewed this prophetic vision 
of the future. We're here on Mount Nebo. You know, Deuteronomy 34 records that God called Moses to the top of Mount Nebo. He was full of strength. His eyes could see in a very important and fine way, but God called him to die. From this mountain you can see into the distance, you can see the desert where Moses and the children of Israel wandered for 40 years. You can see the Dead Sea, you can see Jericho, you can see the area of the Jordan River. God called Moses to be able to see and understand what was going to happen in the future. You see, had Moses not sinned, that one sin, which took glory to himself when he was commanding the water to come out of the rock. Rather, he should have said, this was God bringing the water. If he had not committed that one sin, God would have permitted him to go into the promised land. And we're told in the spirit of prophecy and patriarchs and prophets that God would have taken him to heaven without seeing death. But God had other plans. And as Moses looked out over this incredible valley, God revealed to him not only what he could see physically, but spiritually a vision of the future. And as he saw the children of Israel taking possession of Canaan, as he saw the ups and downs of God's people who were so remiss in giving God glory. And so God would allow trouble and difficulty to come upon them. And he saw this in generation after generation until finally he even saw the time of the Roman occupation. He was taken in vision so that he saw Christ, his simple life, his miracles, his death on the cross. Moses saw his last understanding of what this world was all about. Many times when we expect certain things, God has other plans. God has great plans for you and for me. Just as he had plans for Moses because not long after, he raised him from the dead and took him to heaven as a symbol of those who die firmly in Jesus Christ and then are raised to life everlasting. Just as he had plans for Moses, he had plans for the children of Israel. They crossed the Jordan River under the guidance of Joshua, the appointed leader to succeed Moses. And God has plans for you and for me, figuratively. He wants to lead us across the Jordan River into the Promised Land. What a privilege Moses had seeing what God was going to do for his people throughout history and even up until this very day, July 11, 2015. We will soon cross the figurative Jordan into that promised land and be welcomed by the Father, by Christ, by the Holy Spirit, by Moses, by Elijah, by Enoch and the angels. But back to the Israelites. They were still on the east side of the Jordan after their 40 years in the wilderness. They had not crossed yet. They spent 30 days mourning the loss of Moses. Not until he had been taken from them did they fully understand his fatherly role in their lives, his wisdom and his counsel. However, they were not alone. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night over the sanctuary were constant reminders that the mighty God was by their side. My brothers and sisters here in the Alamo Dome and throughout the world, the almighty God is with us today here and all over this globe as we prepare to cross the Jordan. Don't retreat. As Moses' understudy, Joshua became the recognized leader of Israel. He was courageous, quiet, faithful, firm, caring, loyal, and had complete faith in God. 
It was Joshua whom God chose to lead the children of Israel into the promised land through God's complete and supernatural power. Our scripture reading in Joshua chapter 1 verse 2 tells us God spoke directly to Joshua saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan. Go over this Jordan. Don't retreat. Cross the Jordan. You and all this people to the land which I am giving to them. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I will give you. Joshua and the children of Israel were not to be discouraged or to retreat. God continued in verse 6 and verse 7 with words for us today right here in San Antonio. Be strong and of good courage. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Seventh-day Adventist believers, be of good courage in the Lord. Ask him to help us to keep his moral law and make God's holy word central in all that we do. Don't get stuck on one side or the other of the road. Stay in the middle of God's will. Cross the Jordan and don't retreat. God's holy word. What a precious book this is. His law, his prophecies, his instructions, his gospel, his love letters to us. You can count on the word of God. Now I have three Bibles with me right here and they're very precious. Two of them belonged to ordained ministers of the gospel who have died in Jesus. This first Bible was my grandfather N.C. Wilson's Bible. Grandpa was a wonderful student of the word. He would write me letters of encouragement when I was a young pastor. I loved my grandma and grandpa Wilson. They both loved the word of God and the spirit of prophecy. The second Bible is the Bible of my dear father, Neil C. Wilson, the second N.C. Dad taught me to revere and to believe in God's holy word. Dad loved to preach from the Word, an inexhaustible source of God's instruction. Both my precious mother and my dear father loved the Holy Bible and the spirit of prophecy. They both bequeathed to me a complete trust in and love for a plain reading of the Word of God and a great appreciation for the spirit of prophecy. I never heard one disparaging remark from either one of my parents about the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. Only great respect and acceptance. My brothers and sisters in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the year 2015, I plead with you to have that same love and respect for this book and the spirit of prophecy. If you haven't read much from either one for a while, pick up the Bible and read it. Pick up Steps to Christ, The Desire of Ages, The Ministry of Healing, The Great Controversy, Patriarchs and Prophets, The Testimonies, or any other Spirit of Prophecy book, and just read it. See what God will do for your heart and life. Participate 
with church members all over this globe as we learned last night, as we begin this quinquennium by daily reading one chapter of the Bible and approximately two pages of the Conflict of the Ages series and other books in Believe His Prophets. Of course, if you're on your own Bible reading program, that's just great. No problem at all. If you're on that reading program, go right ahead and use that reading program. But please, move ahead. Let's read and experience the Word of God and the spirit of prophecy in our lives every day. As Seventh-day Adventists, we fully accept the Bible as God's inspired Word. We understand the spirit of prophecy to be the lesser light inspired by the same heavenly inspiration that leads to the greater light, the Bible. At our last general conference session, I should say at the last general conference session, that Ellen White attended. She delivered her message. She left the platform. She stopped and returned, taking the large pulpit Bible in her hands and looking out into that audience proclaimed, I commend to you this book. Brothers and sisters, if we wish to cross the Jordan, let's seriously read God's holy word, letting its instructions through the Holy Spirit's guidance change our lives. The psalmist, David, explained in Psalm 119, verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You can count on God's word and his spirit of prophecy. And here is my Bible. I've had it now for five years. You see, since that time, before that time, I lost another precious Bible on an airplane. I bought this one and I've cherished it. However, since that time, I have lost, I have lost this Bible two times. But both times, the Lord has miraculously returned it to me. It is precious, not only because it is my study and preaching Bible, but because it is the Word of God. Someone who retrieved this Bible the last time I lost it gave me a little attachment for the cover that I use for my Bible. And this little attachment says on here, Ted's Bible Leech to hang on to my Bible. But I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, I will never lose God's Word, even though I may lose this physical Bible. God's Word is sure and foundational and can never be lost. You see, it is everlasting. You can believe in this Word. You can believe it as it reads. This precious book, the Bible, is true and reliable. You can read it in the plain language of your choice, and it rings true. Yes, God actually created this world recently in six literal consecutive days and rested on the seventh day Sabbath and asks us to do the same as an eternal sign to our allegiance to him. The Israelites did miraculously cross the Red Sea. God did provide manna. The Ten Commandments were written with God's own finger. The sanctuary service does show Christ's salvation and ministry on earth and in heaven. Jesus did come as a babe, lived a perfect life, died for us, rose for us, went to heaven, and will return in like manner. Christ is ministering for us in our in the heavenly most holy place as our high priest. And in 1844, the investigative judgment was started. Jesus is coming again. God's word is accurate and true and can be understood just as it reads. 
You see, Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 say the following. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This was God's signal to the Israelites to cross the Jordan. Joshua commanded the crossing preparation. Joshua 3 verse 1 tells us that Joshua rose early and all the children of Israel lodged at the edge of the river. The test had come. It was again time to see God's great miracles. Verse 3 says, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests and the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Verse 5 instructed, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. As we humble ourselves before the Lord and each other, as we plead with God for the latter reign of the Holy Spirit, as we allow the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit to make us more and more like Christ, we will see wonders among us as the Advent message goes like wildfire. In verse 9, Joshua told the people, Hear the words of the Lord your God. You see, God promised to drive out the inhabitants of the promised land. The next developments are absolutely riveting. Joshua 3, 14 to 16 records, When the people set out from the camp to cross over the Jordan, with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away. You see, it was springtime, and the water was very high. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 483, reports, the host descended to the border of the Jordan. All knew, however, that without divine aid, they could not hope to make the passage. At that time of the year, in the spring season, melting snows of the mountains had so raised the Jordan that the river overflowed its banks, making it impossible to cross at the usual fording places. God willed that the passage of Israel over the Jordan should be miraculous. My brothers and sisters, many times God leads us into difficult or impossible situations, either personally or even as a church. Situations where we give Him the glory when we see how He arranges our progress through that difficulty. Brothers and sisters, cross the Jordan. Don't retreat. Do we react? in God's providence and in observing what he has done by giving God the glory when he opens the way for us. That's why God wants us to remember his interventions in our lives and to set up landmark memorials to never forget to cross the Jordan and don't retreat. Verse 17 says the priests who carried the ark into the middle of the Jordan stayed there until the people had crossed the river. Before the priests left, Joshua called for representatives from each of the 12 tribes to take a large rock from the riverbed to represent their tribe in setting up a memorial. Joshua 4 verses 6 to 7 say the following, that this may be a sign among you, when your children ask in time to come, saying, 
What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. There has always been a need to remember, to establish something that will constantly remind you that was the purpose of the stone landmark monument of the Israelites crossing to remember what God had done. That's exactly why he wants us to remember what is happening here in San Antonio, what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives, that our mission is to proclaim, arise, shine, Jesus is coming. Brothers and sisters, you are the landmarks. God has a special purpose for each of us who make up his remnant church to remember how he has led us in the past. In Life Sketches, page 196, we read, in reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say praise God as I see what the Lord has wrought. I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as our leader. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. <clears throat> what a privilege to testify of God's power in leading his Advent movement and what he will do during the final days of Earth's history. Of course, God does not only wish that we remember, he wants us to actively participate in the real mission of his church, the reason you and I are members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I call on all local church members everywhere to participate in a vibrant revival and reformation. You, your family, your church, your community, Lay members, I challenge you to become involved in the daily mission of the church far more than you ever have before. We are counting on you. God is counting on you. You are landmarks, a walking testimony, a memorial for God's truth. Become involved in the greatest evangelistic and mission outreach possible. Take time to read and pray about the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist strategic plan. Reach the world. It is your plan. It is our plan. It is God's plan. Evangelism is the lifeblood of the church. All of us are to be involved in it, either through personal witnessing, small group evangelism, or public evangelism in its various forms. Every time I preach a full evangelistic series like I did this past May in Harare, in Chitungwiza, near Harare in Zimbabwe, I get spiritually re-energized and more grounded in the marvelous biblical understanding that God has given to us as Seventh-day Adventists. I get so excited about God's logical, solid, precious Advent message. I appeal to all our administrators, pastors, and lay people everywhere. Become involved in personal and especially public evangelism, even if you think it won't work where you live. Adapt your methods, but reach out. Every effort under God's guidance that you make in reaching the hearts of people will bear fruit. Evangelism is not dead. It is more alive than ever before. God is in it. It is his plan. He will bless it. We're in this together under the omnipotent hand of God. Church le leaders and church members working hand in hand for mission outreach. Watch him work as we learn to lean completely on his power. 
Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 117, says, The work of God in this earth can never be finished until the men and women comprising our church membership rally to the work and unite their efforts with those ministers and church officers. I tell you, my brothers and sisters, God wants us to unite in the greatest mission outreach the world has ever seen. The latter reign of the Holy Spirit will fall and the work will be finished. Church members, let the Holy Spirit revolutionize your thinking. Take the church's mission of outreach into your hands on a daily basis, working closely with church leaders and pastors. Let it be total participation. Don't only just get involved in the mechanics of the church. Yes, you need to be involved in the inner working of the church to keep it moving ahead, it's true. But even more, we need a total empowerment of lay people in carrying the burden of the church's evangelistic and mission outreach along with pastors and church workers. Tell someone else about your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's time to go home, arise, shine, Jesus is coming. Take up God's command, cross the Jordan, don't retreat. Young people of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I tell you, I am so proud of our young people of this church. They are a precious group of people. <clears throat> Young people, this is your church. This is your Advent movement. This is your mission. Christ is your master. Take advantage of every opportunity of service for others in Jesus' name. Take up God's command. Cross the Jordan. Don't retreat. Pastors, health professionals, teachers, you're doing a wonderful work for the Lord. Stay strong in God's word. Remain grounded in the pillars of God's Advent movement. Take up God's command, cross the Jordan, don't retreat. Husbands, wives, and families, children, don't allow anything to creep into your homes that will distract you from God's plans for you and your children. Eliminate any television, social media, music, books, and other influences that will distract you from Jesus and his biblical truth. <clears throat> Husbands and wives and families, take up God's command. Cross the Jordan. Don't retreat. I appeal to all of us in the church to put away differences of opinion to humble ourselves before God. Now is the time to unify under Christ our righteousness. Councils to Ministers, page 145, tells us that in loving sympathy and confidence, God's workers are to unite with one another. He who says or does anything that tends to separate the members of Christ's church is counterworking the Lord's purpose. Wrangling and dissension in the church, the encouragement of suspicion and unbelief are dishonoring to Christ. God spoke through Ellen White with a pleading entreaty to each of us in Testimonies, Volume 9, page 219. I pray that he will soften and subdue every heart. Let there be no self-exaltation. If the workers will humble their hearts before God, the blessing will come. <clears throat> As we unite under God's direction, he is leading his children towards the Jordan. In so many ways around the world, as heaven touches their lives and those with whom they come in contact. <clears throat> I think of Tihomir Min, a Bulgarian Vietnamese, a young man that I met last year in Hanoi, who shared his personal testimony and ongoing journey towards God's truth. Tihomir wondered about God and his roots while growing up in Bulgaria with a Bulgarian mother and a Vietnamese father. 
When he was about 10 years old, his parents divorced. Tihomir faced challenges in his search for God, including attacks by evil spirits as he tried to find peace. He prayed that if there was a God, would he please help him? Suddenly, he began to find relief and encouragement. He finally found a Christian website which offered him encouragement, some CDs, and the book, The Great Controversy. He found out that the administrator of the website was a Seventh-day Adventist. Reading The Great Controversy led Tihomir to read the Bible, which excited him greatly and changed his life. He told me, my life changed when I opened my eyes for God. Tihomir felt compelled to travel to Vietnam. He found part of his family there, but he discovered a much larger and greater family, the family of God. While in Vietnam, Tihomir experienced some difficult challenges and looked for a church. He tried to find a Seventh-day Adventist church, but we do not own I want to make this point very clear. Be thankful for the churches you worship in. We do not own a single church building in Hanoi and have only a small number of believers in that great city of about seven million people. The Southern Asia Pacific Division, the Southeast Asia Union, the Vietnam Mission, and the General Conference and others have plans to see God's work established in a stronger way in that major capital city. If there is someone, someone listening or viewing, someone in this dome who would like to assist in some way, please contact the Southern Asia Pacific Division or our office. My brothers and sisters, we have a great mission to the cities all over the world. Get involved in meeting the needs of people, Christ's method alone. Well, Tiomir searched the internet to find the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Hanoi. He finally found information and he understood that we really he really didn't understand what we believed, but he wanted to visit just to find out. He began meeting with our small Sabbath-keeping group that was primarily ADRA Vietnam workers. Thank God for the work of our Adventist Development and Relief Agency, ADRA. T. Hermir continued to attend the the weekly services because he found so many happy and encouraging people attending. Eventually he became much more acquainted with Christ and our biblical beliefs. He was overjoyed to find peace at last. Tihomir was baptized and joined the small Seventh-day Adventist Church in Hanoi. He still has personal challenges and difficulties in his Christian journey, but he is witnessing to so many people in high levels of society and is learning more about walking with God every step of the way. In spite of the problems, he still faces difficulties, but he says that finding God was the best thing that has ever happened in his life. Pray for Tiomar in his Tiomir in his daily walk with the Lord as God leads him towards the crossing of the Jordan and the promised land. I think of Dolores Slickers, a wonderfully loving and generous church member who along with her devoted husband Leon helped so many students to find real meaning in life, bringing glory to God in their professions. This last March at the Andrews University board meeting, there was a vacant chair in front of Dolores' nameplate and some lovely flowers placed there by Niels Eric Andreasen, the Andrews University president, as a token of respect and hope. You see, Dolores died last December in a car accident, but awaits her coming king who will lead her across the Jordan to the promised land along with hundreds of students that she helped. I think of Ricky, a deaf mute young man from River Alta, Bolivia, whose prayers were answered after he began to study the Bible on his own. According to Winston Sarzuri, 
East Bolivia Mission Personal Ministries and Evangelism Director, and Robert Costa, our Associate General Conference Ministerial Secretary, Ricky came in contact with the church and its biblical teachings through the internet. In the public school where Ricky studied, there are several other young deaf students. Adventist World Church President Ted Wilson clarifies what the women's ordination vote does and does not do. This general conference session is wrapping up, and many of the folk we talked to said they're about ready to go home. I'm Jeff Williamson, and I'll tell you Jesus, his saving power, and the joyous hope it brings when she realized that Ricky was really interested in studying the Bible. She pushed herself in record time to learn sign language in order to witness for Christ. As this faithful girl shared Jesus with Ricky through sign language, he accepted Christ and all of our fundamental beliefs. He became a strong disciple and a Bible instructor who taught the Advent message to eight other deaf students. Last April, all the deaf students from that school attended an evangelistic series in Bolivia led by John Bradshaw of It Is Written. Praise God for our media ministries in this church. The local government leader in charge of the deaf uh, attended the meetings and was so impressed that our church was interested in the deaf group. And she is now interested in Seventh-day Adventist beliefs. She and her deaf husband are in contact with our local pastors to obtain Adventist materials for the deaf. Let's always show interest in groups with special needs. Take time for those in special situations with whom you can share Christ and this precious Advent message. As a result, a new congregation is on the horizon with many potential deaf, mute members in Santa Cruz, the largest city in Bolivia. Last April, Ricky was baptized. He came out of the water with glad sign language gestures telling the world how happy he was to give his life to Jesus. My fellow brothers and sisters and church members here in this dome and those watching worldwide, do not be discouraged as you march toward the crossing of the Jordan. We are nearing home. We are almost there. Do not be distracted or dismayed. Go forward with complete trust in the Creator, the Redeemer, the Lamb, and the High Priest who tells us in Hebrews 4, verse 16, to come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That time of need may be upon you right now. And it certainly is coming in the near future, according to biblical prophecy, when our only hope and salvation will be in totally leaning on Jesus Christ, the Rock. He is what we need right now in our worldwide work of proclaiming the three angels' messages entrusted to us by heaven itself. Jesus, with his grace, his strength, his matchless love and his righteousness is the core of the three angels' messages and is the only answer for making it across the Jordan. Let's claim the marvelously comforting and encouraging promises of Psalm 37, 5 to 7. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. God is calling you today to join in the final proclamation of Christ's salvation, his good news, and his soon second coming. Let's believe in God's holy word. Believe in the prophetic books of Daniel and Revelation. Believe in the spirit of prophecy. Jesus is coming soon. What a day that will be. 
cross the Jordan. Don't retreat into disbelief and cynicism. We are saved through the justifying and sanctifying power of Jesus Christ and him alone, saved through his righteousness. Christ's sanctuary service points to Christ and his righteousness and should be thoroughly studied and shared. Dig deep in your understanding of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Stay away from superficiality and the suggestion just to say the name of Jesus and then ignore Christ's doctrinal truths. My brothers and sisters, our biblical foundational beliefs and fundamental doctrines all have Christ at the center of every single one. What a privilege to share this prophetic message and humbly ask God for revival and reformation through the power of the Holy Spirit. Cross the Jordan. Don't retreat into legalism, mysticism, superficiality, or meaningless emotionalism. The three angels' messages are to be proclaimed with Holy Spirit power by each of us. Live the truth through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and your diligent study of the Word of God and the Spirit of Prophecy. Cross the Jordan living. Accept and promote God's complete health message that can bless us physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually. Use this right arm of comprehensive health ministry to reach people in mission to the cities and in the rural areas. It's exciting to see how people are accepting the health emphasis with full commitment to allowing God to control their lives and their lifestyles. Cross the Jordan. Don't retreat into skepticism, higher criticism, fanaticism, or formalism. One of these days, very soon, we will look up and see that little cloud that Pastor Jackson's mother talked about. We'll see a small dark cloud about half the size of a man's hand. It will get larger and larger, brighter and brighter, all of heaven poured out for this climactic event with millions of angels making up that marvelous cloud with a brilliant rainbow over it and lightning beneath. Right in the middle of that incredible cloud will be the one that we have waited for, the one who is altogether lovely, our Savior, our Lord, Jesus Christ, coming as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we'll look up and we'll say, this is the God we have waited for. And Christ will look down and say, well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into the joy of your Lord. At last, we will be with him and receive the reward of the righteous who have depended completely on Jesus and his righteousness. We will figuratively cross the Jordan to begin the final journey through space to enter the promised land in heaven. We will be with him in a perfect setting, never again to part as a fulfillment of his promises foretold in Revelation 22. Verses 3 to 7, we read, There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever. And he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Those are God's promises for you for me and for this remnant church, his Advent movement. That wonderful promised land revealed in Revelation is where we will go as we rise to meet him in the air. We will cross the Jordan and go to heaven to be with him forever. What a day that will be. 
by the grace and righteousness of Jesus Christ, I want to be there that day. If that is your wish, as you humbly submit to Christ, sharing his love and prophetic messages with the world, would you join me in standing right now in commitment to our Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. As we commit ourselves into the hands of Jesus, our almighty captain, he will lead us across the Jordan and into the promised land. Reach the world with the extraordinary good news of ultimate victory through the blood and the grace of our Creator, our Redeemer, our High Priest, our coming King, and our best friend, Jesus Christ. Arise, shine. Jesus is coming. I'd like to invite you to turn to the person next to you and take 30 seconds each and pray a prayer of commitment to the Lord, asking God to give you the power to live the life through the power of the Holy Spirit that will proclaim to the world the wonderful three angels' messages and the message that Jesus is coming soon. When each of you have prayed a very short prayer of commitment, remain standing, and I will offer the beginning of a short prayer. The prayer will be completed by Stephanie Don, giving us a wonderful, beautiful, vocal approach of supplication to our Heavenly Father. Please pray together at this time. Just now, the congregation is standing two by two, family units gathered together, praying a prayer of commitment and dedication. I'd like to pray with you. Candice, let's pray. Yeah, let's you lead us, please. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful message, and we do long for you to come soon, dear Lord. We ask that we will put aside all the distractions, and we will see only you, and Lord, Amen. be willing to serve you with all our hearts. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful reminder that heaven will be worth everything, mm. and we mustn't yes. allow anything to keep us from joining uh, and meeting Jesus on that day. Thank you that we have the opportunity to look forward to your soon coming. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful challenge that Pastor Wilson has presented. And as we think about ancient Israel crossing over to the Jordan, coming into the Promised Land, we want to be part of that group. So help every one of us to make that commitment, we pray in your name. Amen. Our prayer and answering our prayer, Lord, we long to be with you. Take us across the Jordan into the Promised Land. We long to be in heaven soon. And now, Lord, listen as we continue our supplication to you in the prayer that you have taught us to say as Stephanie sings to your glory. <laughs> 